Well, uh, now this is the this is the real problem because I mean nothing is nothing is easier than to formulate high ideals, but few things are more difficult than to uh, discover the means whereby those ideals may be implemented. This is the real problem. I mean, one has to dream, but one has to dream in a pragmatic way to to, to consider how we can uh, obey the injunction to love our neighbours and to behave with goodwill. I think one of the basic problems is uh, somehow to find means whereby the extraordinarily violent uh, uh, drives of our instincts and our emotions can be given expression without doing harm either to ourselves or to our neighbours. There are educational possibilities in this thing. I think so. I mean, I, I hope so, because otherwise I don't know what we're going to do. Well, this is my mm. concern also. I, I certainly see mm. psychotherapeutic possibilities, but it's so long and so slow, and uh, there are just so many people, and as you suggest, not much time. Well, of uh, course, this is, uh, I do think, uh, the, the gravest problem. I mean, I think our space of maneuver at present is very small. Uh, I mean, look at what is happening to the underdeveloped countries, the, the pressure of, um, numbers upon resources is so great it seems quite unlikely that these many of these underdeveloped countries will ever be able fully to industrialize because all their resources will simply have to go into feeding the new generation as it appears year by year uh, and they will never be able to stand back far enough to be able to uh, to industrialize and the, it will be like the, the, the parable of their development will be like the, will be the parable of the Red Queen in uh, Addis to the Looking Glass. Remember that Addis and the Red Queen ran like mad, and at the end of a long period of running, they found that they were standing in the same place. And the Red Queen said, yes, in this country, you have to run as fast as you can to stand in the same place, and to get somewhere else, you have to run twice as fast as you can. And this, unhappily, is the situation, I think, of many of the underdeveloped countries at this moment. This is the tragedy of, the, of, of, of our world. And unless we do something extremely r rapidly and extremely efficiently about this, so we're going to be in its gravest trouble. Are the things that we might do, things that for you represent good bets for altering educational emphases? Well, I, I mean, I'm quite sure we have to... Uh, think intensively about this and to experiment. This is finally the problem of what do you do about the irrational. I mean, after all, we have built into us neurologically a kind of Jekyll and Hyde. We have the uh, ancient brain stem, which goes back to enormously remote evolutionary past, and we have a relatively modern neopallium or cortex on top of this, uh, which is uh, quite recent. and the one uh, uh, tends to upset the other. I mean, the, it is uh, the Jekyll and Hyde are, in a sense, built into us. I mean, so, uh, this is the whole natural genetic basis of the conflict in which man has always lived. And we have to recognize this fact, and we have then to work out the best possible ways uh, on every level, physiological, psychological, educational, mm -hmm. sociological, to, to cope with this fact. And the question, I suppose, would come up, education for what in all of this? Well, um, education, first of all, for survival, which is uh, important as far as I'm concerned, and secondly, I mean, the uh, as an ideal, I don't know any higher ideal than the, um, the ideal of... Uh, of actualizing the greatest number of desirable potentialities. I mean, potentialities for goodwill, potentialities for intelligence in every way, potentialities for creativity. I mean, these three things, if we can actualize our potentialities in this direction, and we certainly have them, uh, we have potentialities which have not been actualized, then we've, uh, we've done something. We really have made the best of our human condition. Of late, I know you have made much mention of nonverbal factors, in fact, particularly in education. Uh, this nonverbal aspect intrigues me considerably. We, we have to to think of this uh, of this side of man, which I mean, the, the whole psychophysical organism. There's a very striking phrase in in Spinoza, where that very great philosopher says, 
uh, make the body, you know, I would now say the psychophysical organism, make the body capable of doing many things. In this way, you, uh, this will help you to perfect the mind and to come to the intellectual love of God. But this is a very striking phrase from a philosopher who was profoundly intellectual. But I mean, he saw quite clearly that we have to take the mind-body as it is and to, to make it capable of responding to the external world and to the, to the events within itself in a clear, a clear awareness. We have to heighten our awareness and heighten the, the things that we do with it. And this requires, it seems to me, a whole kind of, of education on the non-verbal level. Uh, in a certain sense, I would say that the, the whole, uh, an entire program for both kinds of education, uh, both on the conceptual and verbal level and on the non-verbal level, uh, is uh, outlined by Wordsworth. William is uh, sitting on a stone by the side of a lake, and his friend Matthew comes to him and says, Why do you spend all your time sitting here? Why aren't you reading your books? And uh, he replies that uh, there is besides reading books, there is a kind of wisdom which comes to man through what he calls a wise passiveness. He says, the, the eye cannot choose but see, we cannot bid the ear be still. Our bodies feel where'er they be against or with our will. No less I deem that there are powers which of themselves our minds impress, that we can feed this mind of ours in a wise passiveness. And this is uh, the, this I idea of a wise passiveness runs all through the literature of art. You'll find this again and again, this, uh, this prelude to creativity, alert passivity. And this comes again and again in the literature of art, and it comes again and again in the literature of mystical religion, the necessity of being passive and receptive as well as active. I mean, that the, uh, we must somehow learn to move back and forth between a wise activity and a wise passiveness. We must be able to take in in order to be able to give out. The, the great mystic uh, Meister Eckhart says, what I take in by contemplation, I give out in love. And, and this, uh, I think, is equally true. You give it out not merely in love, you give it out in creation, you give it out in, uh, in thought. I mean, that uh, I personally believe strongly in quotes, inspiration. I mean, whether it comes from the nine muses, I don't know, but it, it is a psychological fact, and it, inspiration comes in this state of alert passivity. And yet, of course, I think we have, don't we, you know, a Western culture, an emphasis on the activity, doing something, and always showing some final product which represents the worth of the uh, person who produces it. Yes, and yet these uh, Western artists, just as much as anybody else, have insisted that the receptivity was essential. I mean, that not merely did you have to impose a frame of reference upon the, upon the world, you had also to let the world come to you without a frame of reference, and to come to you, um, so to say, as, a, as things in themselves. I mean, what Kant said, you could never see the Ding an sich, the thing in itself. But uh, you have to admit it, 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 it's never the thing in itself, but it is very nearly the experience uh, unmodified by the uh, conceptualizing and symbol-making cortex. It just comes to you, and, it's, uh, and what is within has to be allowed to come to you without being modified uh, by the conceptual mind. Is this passivity in Western religion? In certainly in the mystical tradition, it's it's very strong. I would say. I mean, you find it throughout the great medieval mystics. You find it throughout the seventeenth uh, century mystics. You find it in the great uh, English mystic of the eighteenth century, William Law. And you find it, of course, in the Quakers. I mean, who have probably more than any Protestant uh, denomination been concerned with the, this. Uh, alert passivity. After all, the, the whole business of the Quaker silence is, a, uh, is to create circumstances in which alert passivity is possible and in which uh, something can come through. 
from the deep mind or from that which lies beyond the deep mind. And you have feeling that this can be incorporated within a general standardized procedure at the level of school for the younger children? I don't know why not. I mean, it, it's, in, at present it would be a little difficult, but uh, I, as I say, we can do whatever we want. I mean, we're, we're not fools.